Hi, my name's Tom Benn and I'm a novelist, screenwriter and lecturer in crime writing at the University of East Anglia. I want to thank you for joining us for this very special event with David Peace. Noirich is a partnership between UEA and the National Centre for Writing. Very special thanks go to our festival sponsor, The Crime Vault, our booksellers, Gerald, and Arts Council England for making this event possible. Now, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce David Peace. Peace is the author of The Red Riding Quartet, GB84, The Damned United and more. Peace's crime epics read like grimoires, haunted transmissions, detective mysteries in which solutions and justice seem to be carried out of reach by a cosmic tide of dark energy. They give the impression less of people living through history and more of history living through people, eclipsing the present and sealing off the future like a cursed tomb. His Tokyo trilogy comprising Tokyo Zero, Occupied City, and the long-awaited Tokyo Redux is an absorbing, overwhelming achievement in crime writing. These are conspiracy thrillers voiced by those silenced on the margins of history, told in stark and incantatory prose. Each book mines actual 20th century crimes of post-war Japan, blurring the line between fact and invention to create urgent moral inquiries into the hearts, minds and deeds of the powerful and the powerless. You could say I'm a fan. David Peace, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me and thanks, Tom, for that introduction. It's very kind. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, I think you'd like to begin with a, a short reading uh, from the first book in the trilogy. Is that right? Yeah, I've heard, um, a, a short reading from Tokyo Year Zero. Um, yeah, thank you. A century of change takes place in one night of fire. Neighbourhoods bombed to the ground, their people burnt to death. Where there were factories and homes, where there were workers and children, now there is only dust, now there is only ash, and no one will remember those buildings. No one will remember those people. No one will remember anything. Things that happened last week already seem as though they happened years, even decades before. Things that happened only yesterday no longer even register. This is the war now. There are severed legs and there are severed heads, a woman's trunk with its intestines spilled, a child's spectacles melted to its face, the dead in clusters, pets and babies, dogs and children, men and women, old and young, soldier and civilian, each one indistinguishable from the other. The smell of apricots, each burnt, each dead. This is my war now, the air warm and dawn pink. The smell of apricots, black pails of badding, black pails of bedding, black piles of possessions strewn on either side of the road. The stench of rotten apricots, their black bicycles lie fallen, their black bodies huddled together. The smell of apricots, black factories and black bathhouses still smouldering. That stench of rotten apricots, the all clear signal now, I should not be here. The orders to assemble at various elementary schools, the orders to avoid certain other schools, the smell of apricots. I stagger and I stumble on, Yuki still in my arms, I should not be here. I want to leave her, I want to go home, but I cannot, the stench of rotten apricots. I stagger and I stumble through the black columns of survivors, their black beddings on their backs, their black bicycles at their sides. I should not be here, I stagger and I stumble on until we reach the Sumida River, the river now black with bodies, the smell of apricots. I carry Yuki across the black bridge. I should not be here. I stagger and I stumble past soldiers clearing the black streets, shifting the black bodies into the backs of their trucks with hooks, the stench of rotten apricots. I stagger and I stumble at the black flesh tears. The black bodies fall apart. I should not be here until the air is no longer warm, the dawn no longer pink, just the smell of apricots until I can look no more. I stagger and I stumble. Should not be here. I should not be here until hours, maybe days later. I carry her up the stairs of a deserted block of apartments in Shinagawa. Should not be here until I lay her down on the pale tatami mats of a second floor room, frayed and well warm. The chrysanthemum, chrysan chrysanthemum wallpaper limp and peeling. Here in the half light, I take the bottle out of my pocket, unscrew the cap of the bottle. I take the cotton wool out of the neck of the bottle. I begin to count out the pills. I should not be here. One count the tin, two. I count and I count. I take out a second bottle, I count out the pills, 31 Calmatin, 32, count and I count, I take out the third bottle, 61 Calmatin, 62, I count and I count the fourth bottle and then the fifth, 121 Calmatin, I should not be here on my knees, this is surrender, I should not be here, this is defeat. Thank you. 
Wow, thank you. Thank you for that reading. Um, almost um, an incantation, um, kind of like a, a spell to raise the dead almost. Um, and I want to ask you later about your hallmark repetitions and rhythms. Um, but I, I'd like to th start, I think, with um, a more general question. Um, you know, with your Tokyo trilogy, uh, I, I'm really interested to know what drew you to this particular constellation of historical crimes. Um, the, the latest Tokyo Redux concerns the Shimayama incident, you know, the actual unsolved death of the president of the Japanese National Railways in 1949. When you were conceiving this post-war Japan trilogy, did you know this was the crime you were going to end on and, and, and why this crime? I did know that that would be the crime that would, would feature in the last book. Um, the, the, the trilogy really came out of the, the simple fact that I, I you know, I having grown up in West Yorkshire, lived in Manchester for a long time, went to Istanbul. I ended up in Tokyo in 1994. And um, initially, my, my, my time here, I was spent writing the Red Riding Quartet, uh, GB84, The Damned United, all books about the time and place I grew up in. Um, but at the same time, I was living in, in the, where I'm speaking to you now from, from the east end of, in, in the east end of Tokyo. Um, I, during that period, um, I had two children and I was very conscious that I didn't know the, the history of, of, of the place uh, to tell them um, as they grew up. And I wanted to know that history myself. And as I was writing the, 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 Yorkshire, the Yorkshire books, GB84 and so on, I was also, in, if you like, in my free time, reading a lot of Japanese literature, a lot of Japanese history, and becoming more and more interested in how the city that I live in and have lived in for since ninety four was this this was very modern, possibly the world's largest city. You know, people have the very clear image of it of it, a very modern neon city, and yet, first of all, in nineteen twenty three, it was destroyed in the Great Kanto earthquake, and then it was rebuilt, and then in um, the of a March and May of 1945, it was it was essentially bombed flat, particularly the area I, 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 I've always lived in. And I just wanted to really know how that city rose from ruin, defeat, surrender into this modern city. And I and I and I felt that the occupation period, which uh, I mean, maybe because having been educated in Britain, I wasn't particularly familiar with. That the that the U.S. Army and and actually British and Commonwealth soldiers occupied Japan from forty five to fifty two, and I thought that, um, you know, I've always believed that that, that cr crimes are a way to examine a, a time and place, and there were from the research I was doing into the occupation period, there were three particular true crimes, that I thought form would form the basis of these three of these three novels. So that the the first crime. It, the first crimes in Tokyo Year Zero relate to a real life uh, serial killer and rapist called Kodaira Yoshio, who committed these terrible crimes immediately before and then after the Japanese surrender. Um, and then the, the second crimes, um, uh, the bank, the Tagin bank poisonings that happened in 1948. Um, and then the third, uh, the third crimes, as, as you say, are the, the third crime. And I must point out, some people don't actually think it was a crime, but the, 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 the death of the president of the Japanese National Railway, Sadanori Shimiyama, in July 49, forms the basis of the last book. So it was always planned, it was always planned that these three crimes to me represented different aspects of the occupation, um, both for the occupier, but particularly for the occupied. Right. Yeah. I think, yeah, my next question then, I suppose, is. How did you go about kind of setting your narrative and ethical dimensions when you're narrativizing all this history into a crime novel or series of crime novels, especially events that weren't necessarily part of your own formative cultural or national DNA? You know, these real events um, with all their loose ends and actual unknowns and also the fixed material, the, you know, the unmovable facts that, you know, there are, you know, perceptions and accounts that's, that suggest this wasn't uh, a crime it was a, or is a suicide. It, it wasn't a murderer. Um, uh, you know those kinds of narrative and ethical dimensions, I suppose. Well, uh, I mean the the, the 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 essential techniques 
research or kind of pattern of the research and work that I that that, that I do has has remained pretty much unchanged since. Which, so I sort of came upon it writing the Red Riding Quartet, um, and it it really begins with um, going to the public record, by, by which I mean the it, you know the the, the newspapers. Um, and any non-fiction books that are written about a case or the time or the politics. But I would broaden that out then to the novels, the music, the cinema. Um, in the case of, say, the Shimayama incident or, or uh, the Shimayama case, there was also a massive material compiled by the, by the American occupation. So those, those their, their files on the case, uh, there were also CIA files pertaining to it, but the majority of them were redacted. Um, of course, the, the vast majority of material um, is in is in Japanese, and my Japanese reading is not is not good enough to read a lot of the a lot of the particularly kanji and uh, 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 and newspapers and so forth from 1949. So I've been very very fortunate to have had a lot of help from uh, my Japanese the, my editor of my. The, the Japanese publisher, the, his, the editor there, uh, Nagashi, Mr. Nagashima, and then c- colleagues and friends in, in in Japan. And actually, that I think that also gave me uh, the mistakes in the book. As every you know, it's a common thing, but really, the, all the mistakes and things in the book and so forth and anything those are all my responsibility. But I think you know, writing about a time and place, I I. I didn't experience myself a, 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 cult, a, a, a culture, a, a country that is that is, that is not mine. But but I there, there is a, I, I think huge responsibility not to add to the, you know, to misinformation or 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 to will, will be willfully wrong. And so to have the kind of the support, I'm very fortunate to have that kind of support net. You know, so my first reader is my Japanese editor. Would you know where he would. Yeah, you know, he would. You know, I mean, I remember. You know, for example, particularly, particularly Tokyo Year Zero, which was really fraught for me as a as a writing experience. Because sorry, it sounds about, sorry, it sounds so dramatic. It was certainly more challenging than writing about about you know about West Yorkshire. Um, in, in you know, which I which I'd which I'd grown grown up in. Um, you know, um, so that 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 kind of public record. Um, which, to be honest, with Redux, in the end, overwhelmed me, um, and, and was part of the reason the book took so long, um, because because that that case, the pre the previous, you know, the, 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 the Kodaira Yoshio case in 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 Tokyo Year Zero is actually hardly known in in Japan. It's it's the subject of like some kind of like terrible exploitation movie and a couple of novels, but but really, really it's not. The majority of Japanese people, you know, I'm generalizing, but I would say the majority of Japanese people have not heard of it. Um, but the, the Tegin Bank incident in, in, in Occupy City is, is more well known. But the Shimayama case, I mean, at one time occupied a place in in Japanese culture, somewhat akin to say the Kennedy assassination, in the amount of conspiracies and material that, yes, that grew yes. up around it. Yeah. So, so in, yeah. in the in the Shimayama incident, you know, has this obviously enormous significance and familiarity to a Japanese readership, mm. but it's not necessarily as familiar to an international readership. Say, did that affect at all how you dramatized it, and for whom? Yeah, I, I, I know this is. So this is. I mean. Primarily, and this is true of all the books, I write the books for myself. And I, I know that sounds very, very arrogant, but I don't, the only reason I say that is because I, well, no, but, 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 but I have a very clear reason why, because um, I can never imagine who the, who the reader might, who the reader might be. Um, you know, so, so I have to, first of all, I have to, you know, be, be one hundred percent sure that this is this this is right to me, right? You know, um, um, but I mean, I did feel though with the Shimayama case that it's such a complex case, and that particularly that one of the things I've become increasingly interested in is is time, it, 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 the effect of time on crime. I mean, I was always fascinated by a particular time and a place, but I think in, in previous books, I was very obsessed with 
almost trying to get back to a particular time and place. But with the Shimiyama case, the 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 the, the case the case changes over the, over the years. So, for example, when so just I, I, just to, for for people listening who don't know anything about this at all, which, um, so. President Shimiyama was the the newly appointed by the American occupiers uh, head of the Japanese National Railways. He was tasked with um, firing 100,000 employees. He he announced on July the 4th, 1949, the first 30,000 redundancies. Uh, the next day, he went missing inside a department store. He was gone all day. The, the, the police and the Americans tore the city apart looking for him. Soon after midnight on um, the next day, he was found. His body was found dead on railway tracks just just to the north of where I'm talking to you from now. And he um, had been he'd been hit by the train and decapitated. So there was first of all an argument about whether he had whether he'd been alive when the train hit him or whether he'd been you know, had been murdered. So there was immediately a kind of suicide murder theory grew up, which has always, always stayed around the case. But but initially the there was a there was a move by certainly the Americans and uh Japanese right wing parties to immediately blame the Japanese Communist Party, the trade unions, the Japanese left for the death of Shimiyama. And the Shimiyama uh, and then the, the, the left wing in Japan actually thought that Shimayama had committed suicide due to pressure from the Americans. And then these 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 positions then actually became became reversed. So that actually say by the time you get to say nineteen sixty four, which the second part of the book is uh set in, that those positions have reversed. So the the the, the, the Japanese left wing and some very, very uh well known Japanese crime writers and, and uh, other uh, and novelists were campaigning about you know were behind a campaign to prove that actually he'd been murdered by the Japanese right with in collusion with the Americans. Meanwhile, the right and the Americans were suggesting actually he'd committed suicide under pressure from the communists. So, so the the the, the way that this crime changed was also something that I really wanted to be able to convey in the book, and that's why the book has three distinct time yeah. frames. And I think that I think because it's so complicated. I mean, I'm even I'm even botching it up trying to explain it now but, but because it's no, so complicated no, so, because it's so complicated i did think that it the the easiest way was really for the book to open with a, a the, the, the kind of if you like a and it was based on the fact that the americans as occupiers very often had nothing to do with japanese crimes or or or, or suicides murders and so forth they just let the japanese police get on with that but anything that touched upon having a political dimension or ramifications for the occupation, they had kind of their own kind of like investigators in this public safety division. And there was a real life figure called Harry Shupak, who I became like searching through the GHQ records. I became quite fascinated with and he formed the basis then of the Harry Sweeney character who narrates the first third of the book. And I mean, Shupak himself seemed to have stepped straight out of the pages of, you know, I mean, one of my huge heroes is Dashiell Hammett. And he seemed to have stepped out of, uh, yeah, correct. So I mean, I thought Sweeney seemed to be like a gift. He seems to have stepped like, like he's just, he's, you know, he's just left, you know, um, he could have been in the glass key. He could have been in your know, red harvest. And so, and I actually felt that actually helped not only me navigate this this alien world with like of like occupiers and occupied, but also I felt that for readers not familiar with Japan, it would it, it is I think an advantage I, I think to have this non Japanese narrator uh, trying to understand the crime. Yeah, you, you said so many interesting things there that I want to unpack. I think the Hammett reference is, is key. You know, it kind of reminded me of uh, sweet, the, the Harry Sweeney character, a bit of the Flickcraft parable from the Maltese Falcon. Yeah. You know, this ordinary man who kind of has a brush with death and decides to kind of disappear, walk out on his life. And a lot of the, the men in these books yeah. kind of have yeah. vanished, you know, literally in the yeah. kind of Shimayama case for a while. And yeah. then um, yeah. have I have I got that wrong or is, is that is that something you're playing with there? It wasn't actually. It wasn't. Now you say it. I think well, maybe. I, I, actually, I was more thinking. Actually, I, I, I think 
I think possibly there was an element of Simenon's um, The Man Who Watched the Trains Go By. That was another kind of quite an influence on the text that in terms of a disappearing, of people trying to disappear and so forth. And I've always, I have always really been fascinated by, by that, that, that people who just, you know, exit their lives. Um, so, so, but that I, but I think now you say it, I think, yeah, possibly that was a, you know, there's a subconscious nod there. Something there, another, another yeah. kind of occult synchronicity. Yeah. I'm also interested in what you said there about kind of this obsession or kind of the, the, the refinement of what the time, how time functions in your book, narrative time. And I suppose like, you know, time is, is the kind of, it's supposed to be the detective's um, enemy, isn't it? You know, cases yeah. are solved very quickly. Yeah. But for the historian, time is, you know, maybe naively supposed to be your friend. It gives you perspective, yeah. it gives yeah. you distance. Yeah. And, and, you know, I suppose the traditional naive function of the historian or the true crime writer or even the detective figure would cast them as, light bringers you know they're there to illuminate all these what's and how's and why's of significant events like murders or military occupations or disappearances but um i don't know if you, you remember you know the late great mark fisher in a championing yeah. essay about your crime novels he wrote quote in the end everything in these books succumbs to total murk at a certain point it is unclear as to whether we have crossed over into the land of the dead and i love that phrase i think it's very true of this book too in some ways you know, if, if, if P.D. James defined the detective novel as being not about murder, but about the restoration of order through the efforts of a detective to expose the truth and solve the case, you know, Sweeney and your other detectives, and they seem to invert that sequence. You know, Tokyo Redux starts with the illusion of order and seems to progress into disorder. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to ask about that and then kind of more specifically that inverted line that recurs throughout this book where you say the mystery to the solution rather than the solution to the mystery. Seem, there seems to be a, a kind of connection there. Yeah, and I, I think I think I, I think all I, I think this I think this dates back to the, the also to the to the Red Riding books that I've never found. um you know, I've never been very comfortable with the with the with with the closure um, that 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 that, that much of you know uh, detective or mystery crime fiction or films has. Um, I've you know I've I mean we I think we've all you know living through the histories we've lived through or reading through histories. It's it it, it they're just it. Yes, the circus may move on. Yeah, there may, there, you know, even there may be sentencing, there may be so forth. But you know, um, you know, in the in the you know in the in the taking the Tokyo trilogy, you know, they were they were still after the, with, with the Kodaira case, which was in a way the most open and shut case. That the police arrested the man, they they had the evidence, he confessed. But there were still there were still victims who they, people were not sure whether he was. You know whether there was still some real kind of ambiguity and debate about you know how many people he'd killed, and there were still some um, bodies that had been found in the course of the investigation that had not been identified. And there are parallels there with with the Yorkshire Ripper case, which you know there are you know particularly now Peter Sutcliffe has died. We you know there are so many people who have not had answers to you know. So that that was a kind of so that was that kind of I think is a hangover from a, from growing up with with that kind of you know, or or for example you know with with the miners' strike with GB eighty four that you know there there are there are there are you know people the the, the 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 suffering that people went through in that year did did not did not end and it's defined their lives for, for, for the rest of their lives and there are people that you know if you take the most famous incident being Augury, you know like. Like Hillsborough, there's been no justice. You know, we look at we look at we look at you know look at everything that happened in Northern Ireland. How unending that pain is, and the quest for justice. And then going back, say to say to, to, to the Tokyo books in Occupied City, a man was arrested, Hirasawa. He he did initially confess. He retracted his confession. He was found guilty. He was sentenced to death. But he was never executed. No Japanese Minister of Justice would execute him because there were still very many questions. And with Occupied City, my my kind of driving kind of force with that book was I, I didn't know who had committed these bank crimes, uh, the, the bank poisonings. But I but I was pretty certain, as certain as I could be, that it hadn't been Hirasawa. And then with with the, with the Shimayama case. It's not, you know, as I say, not some people would say 
it's not even a crime. Some people would say it's a, it was a suicide or it was an accident. And the statute of limitations, you know, from a legal governmental point of view, ended in 1964. But the consequences of his death in the way that um, it really crushed the Japanese Communist Party, really set back Japanese trade unionism, um, the, the consequences and legacies of that death are, are, are with Japan to this day. So, I mean, to me, to me, the idea that you're going to, you're going to, yeah, I, I would love to be the bringer of light, but I, I just, it just, in the, in the, in the cases that I've written about or, you know, the, the things that I'm interested in, it, it's, it's just, to me, it's not, it's not particularly murk. It's just a, an absolute fog of lies and misinformation. Sure. And I think what you were talking there about, you know, the kind of these past events and the kind of the trauma and suffering that is ongoing and that kind of informs the present and infects the present. Um, you know, there's, there's a kind of horror to that. There's an element of horror. You know, one of the ways I admire your work and by, is by thinking about it in terms of genre and form. You know, you are celebrated as an innovator. And in some sense, your novels do map onto horror as, as much as crime. You know, horror is the genre, supposedly, in which mainstream audiences will accept these unhappy, inconclusive endings in which the baddies seem to triumph and the protagonists are defeated or silenced or corrupted or humbled. You know, where the truth doesn't set anybody free. You know, it isn't this liberating force. It's... In your books, it's often an annihilating one, you know, and these collisions and overlaps between horror and crime come up a lot in your work, I think. You know, they, they are very gothic novels in many ways. Is this something you think about in terms yeah. of genres? <clears throat> yes, I, I mean, um, I mean, I'm, you know, one of my uh, one of my one of my very favorite crime novels is um, Falling Angel, uh, William Hortsberg, which was made as Angel Heart. Um, yeah. And um I also, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very, <laughs> for example, I'm, a, I, I, I'm a very much enjoy the novels and films, the, the, the Exorcist novels and films. Um, so, I, but, but also, of course, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, you know, I, I think people have said before, but I mean, I think, I think possibly, like, you know, you know, being forced and enjoying studying like w Wuthering Heights, for example, possibly had, a, had a, you know, for, I studied a lot of, I, you know, because of the age I am and being educated in England, I, I studied a lot of of Gothic novels as well. Um, so I think, and and also, you know, I, I, I you know, I, 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 I read. You know Lovecraft. Uh, I, you know, I read M. R. James. Uh, you know, I mean, The Fall are my favourite band. So, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a kind of, I think it's a kind of, I think that's where it all comes from. It all feeds into, it all comes from that. I think really. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You know, if something like The Wicker Man were presented to someone as a crime film or a crime narrative, yeah. which is what it begins as, you know, a dogged detective yeah. trying to solve a mystery, interviewing suspects, frustrated every turn, then exposing this conspiracy, and he yeah. gets literally burned alive for his troubles. You know, it, yeah. it sounds outrageous, but presented as horror, it suddenly makes sense. It has its own logic yeah. and ontology. You know, we're trying to solve a mystery, you know, lead you to the asylum or the grave, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, like it does in Lovecraft, as you mentioned, you know. Um, it's it has a kind of ni nightmare logic to it, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, um... and I, yeah, and I think also there's a. I think I kind of picked up. I think quite a lot. And actually, the the one of the narrative strands of uh, Tokyo Redux follows that the 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 kind of missing writer Kuroda Roman. That kind of narrative strand, I think, is very heavily influenced by by the the. Japanese crime fiction is quite fascinating because it's, it, it falls into two distinct camps. It falls into a kind of what's known as social crime, which is like personified by Matsumoto Seicho, who is like a hero to me, a you know, uh, left-wing Japanese crime writer who championed, like he wrote novels, but also championed true crime cases such as the Tegin Bank, the Shimoyama. And his work was very, very much... Um, integral to very very important to me in writing this book and so he is a a, a, a real with dashiell hammett manchette shasha he's a huge hero to me but at the same time i do have a great affection for the other strand which is the 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 kind of the more the, the more traditional mystery novel which is the you know like personified by the locked room um so, but but actually in japan it there it's distinctly gothic edogawa rampo 
like people might what might be familiar with Edgar Arampo. Um, you know, there, there's a whole there's a whole line of quite gothic Japanese crime fiction that that that, that I actually read, you know, quite and still read quite avidly as well. So I, I kind of I, I I somehow try to combine <laughs> maybe very sure, completely yeah. unsuccessfully, but <laughs> not, not at all. That that, that kind of cross pollination um, across style and form um, and theme really really comes across in this book. Uh, and one of my students, so I've got some questions at the end um, from my students, has a question about kind of Japanese crime writing. So we can come back to that point. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about. Um, well, your last book, Patient X, um, you know, obviously is, is kind of about a, a Japanese writer, you know, ostensibly some, you know, crime and gothic and other genres. And, you know, that book, Patient X, featured quite extraordinary acts of literary ventriloquism in which you were writing through another writer's writing, which is so interesting to me. And also with the added intermediary of translation, um, you know, was there anything in that process that carried over to this book, Tokyo Redux? Or do you, oh, or do yeah. you feel this novel would have been the same had you no, no, written no, the word no, between no, two no, and three? No. No, no. I mean, I mean, I think, I think Tokyo Redux is quite clear. You know, I mean, so when I finished Occupied City, I, which was which was published in two thousand and nine, um, I was really immediately then began working on 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 the book that became Tokyo Redux. But um, but it was interrupted by a number of things. I moved back. I moved back to the UK for two years, back to West Yorkshire, and then. I moved then back again to Japan. And the, when I moved back to Japan, I immediately began writing Red or Dead, the, the novel about Bill Shankly. And I think that Red or Dead, for example, very much informs a lot of the Sweeney narrative. You know, when, when I say it was influenced by Dashiell Hammett, actually Red or Dead was very influenced by Dashiell Hammett as well. So it's a bit that. Um, and then I had been working for for you know, I don't know, years and years on these kind of homages to um, the Japanese writer Ryonosuke Akutagawa, um, whose you know, the structure of his novel *In a Grove*, which was filmed by Kurosawa's *Rashomon*, where you have you have competing narratives set, you know, with contrasting versions. Go. When I first read *In a Grove*, when I first came to Japan in '94, I, I, I was blown away it was a real yeah there was some great 94 was important yeah there were some moments for me in my writing with you know like reading white jazz by james elroy or reading Derek raymond or manchette or uh, but, but akutagawa and inner grove was a was a huge moment and that led to a fascination with 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 akutagawa and then trying to kind of try to tell his life story through his own stories um but uh, and that and those stories built up, and 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 so after I'd finished Red or Dead, I was I again went back to Tokyo Redux and worked for it on about two years on it, um, but it didn't, still didn't kind of come. And meanwhile, I was kind of these Akutagawa stories were just getting there were more and more of them, and I was just thinking that you know, I I just I just felt I had to get that book. Out these stories out, and uh, and actually, probably the most the most kind of the most gothic thing I've ever written is probably Jack the Ripper's bedroom in in that in that in that collection of stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Uh, I, I also wanted to ask you about your hallmark repetitions. You know, which we've alluded to earlier, um, not least in your reading, um, um, which you know surface here in quite ambiguous ways in this novel in particular. Um, what can you tell us about these rep repetitions of syntax and process? You know, when you describe your detectives like um, Sweeney in this book going through certain motions and rituals, like almost in fugue states of trauma repetition, repeated actions as ostensibly banal, you know, it's like checking the post or shaving in the mirror. They take on a strange or um, estranged quality, right? Well, yeah, I mean, the... I, I mean, I don't actually set out to write really, really repetitious. You know, I don't you know wake <laughs> up in the morning think I'm going to you know crack out another like you know six thousand words of like you know like a man buttering his toast. I don't, <laughs> but it, but but I, but but it, I I do feel that well you know I've always felt that these that these repetitions and routines are such a part of our of our, of our lives, and and they. You know they they can either they can either sustain us or suffocate us. And you know so for for example, I suppose they, you know, 
again, Red or Dead was, a, I suppose, was a, I suppose the, the book that that I kind of pushed that to the to the to its limit because, you know, if anything is repetitious, it's football. It's just you know, it's just routine and repetition. And and actually, in Shankly's case, the routine and repetition led to led to this glorious um, achievement at Liverpool Football Club and created the club that exists now through repetition and routine and hard work and and doing that together in a in a, a um, communally and building like a community. And so that was a that was a I suppose when it reached its kind of to me it was most Im- but I only use it when when it actually is you know it's when it's important. I mean it does also though um have another um role in that it uh, as well as as well as theme having the theme of repetition and routine uh, and how much that you know is prevalent in our lives it it also um has a narrative function for me because i mean my i i work through reading the books allowed over and over and like so they have a they have a to me they have a rhythm um and and that rhythm is you know the 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 but, but you know there are, there are in a way the repetitions act like to me choruses or or kind of markers and and, and so forth so they, they they have a kind of duality um within the text but but they, but they um but but they are done for very very specific specific reasons yeah, it certainly gives it gives the the text that musicality, that discordance. You know, you mentioned that the four your favorite band, and you, you can kind of map that onto this in some ways. And each each book in the in um, in the the Tokyo trilogy seems to have a very different rhythm. I mean, I mean this this novel is formally ambitious as your work is known to be, but it is slightly more conventional, at least in its page presentation, than Occupied City is. You know, was there a conscious effort this time? To, to kind of find a different rhythm, or even to tell it straight, tell it straight, or or straighter. Actually, I always try to tell it straight. I, mean, I really always try to tell it straight. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, I, I still, you know, I, I mean, the, you know, possibly the, the most successful book I've had in terms of like reaching a wide audience was The Damned United, but The Damned United had a, a second person narrative. Like alternating with the first person narrative, and that you know that that to me, I, I, I did think that's maybe you know not, that's not going to work. But nobody ever mentions it. No one says, "Oh, you know, that's really difficult or formally," you know. It, it's so I I just think um, I I don't I don't see what I do as I, I don't see any of it. You know, I mean, there are I, I know that there are passages in Occupied City where you know there's 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 um uh usual text italic text capital letters and it's like and and you know and the, these blocks of text you can read them either across or you can read them down and you can just follow each one down and it was very intricate and took me a long time but actually i i but but actually you know what i've what i found is when when you know uh, okay, sorry, it doesn't happen very often that children have a misfortune to stumble across my work, but but actually, you know, like, you know, people have told me their kids find it really, really easy. I think it's just somehow, um, I, I don't know. I think, I think we're conditioned into a certain kind of book, unfortunately, um, and 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 so that my my books appear challenging, but I, actually, I, I don't I don't really think they are. Person. Yeah, and that's kind of a preconceived notion people have on things that are quote unquote difficult or high culture or, yeah. or modernist leaning, isn't it? This idea that, that it's not for you, that it's being gatekept, you know, gate, gatekeepers yeah. are going to take it away from you. You know, don't, 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 but genre is, a, is kind of a, a way to kind of invade and vandalize that, isn't it? You, you can get away yeah. with a lot, a, a lot of things ostensibly if, if they're called genre in terms of that, you know, they're seen by more yeah. eyeballs. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned white jazz earlier, which you know, typographically and stylistically, you know, has is is like B.S. Johnson or Joyce, but it also, you know, it also has so much narrative drive, narrative impetus that um, you you can read it on a di- on a different level or enjoy both simultaneously. And and your work, um, um, you know, certainly a- a- achieves that, doesn't it? Um, um, at least it do- you know it does to me. Well, that was, thank you. I mean, I hope. I mean, as I say, I don't. I don't really. Not, not. I don't ever try to write something that's willfully difficult or or impenetrable or you know. Uh, it, it, 
the, I very much sort of grew up in a kind of brick tradition that really the, 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 the material chooses the form. So it, it's the, it, it is in, it's essential for me that the, 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 the narrative form that I'm using is chosen very specifically in order that, uh, that it, that it brings out the, the material itself, but it, that it, you know, so for example, that, you know, that it, that it conveys the, 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 the tragedy of the suffering and the, and the uncertainty of, of a crime, or it, or it conveys, for example, the, the struggle and the repetition involved in Shankly creating a football team. There, there, there are very specific reasons why I choose these, these forms. Yeah, that, that, I mean, absolutely, that marriage of content and form is, is very explicit here. Um, I wanted to kind of um, circle back slightly to, um, you know, the, these kind of themes of time and, you know, things about things being in conversation with the past and the present and how they infect each other. Obviously, we've, we've just had the Tokyo Olympics this summer, you know, in the middle section of Tokyo Redux has the kind of uh, the, the 1964 Tokyo Olympics as its backdrop. And there are there are lots and lots of other synchronicities which kept cropping up to me, you know, reading it now, which, you know, bring the past into conversation with our present. And, you know, maybe one in the broadest sense just might be the role of political conspiracy narratives in 2021, you know, yeah. when everyone and their uncle is suddenly a conspiracy expert on Facebook yeah. in the wake of Trump and the handling yeah. of the pandemic, etc. So just reading a conspiracy thriller you know, in our current context, seems very different to reading Occupied City 10 years ago. Because, like, while the past infects the present, the present also infects how we see the past, right? Yeah. So was that something you were conscious of while you were writing this one, just how much the world has changed in that last decade? Um, I, 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 actually, I don't... I, I can't say that... Uh, I, I mean, I... I mean, I do. I mean, in my own in my own teaching, like in my own classes. I mean, I I am very keen when we when we when we're talking about texts, you know, very keen on what I just you know. I don't think this is original to me, but like the free times of a text, the time the text is written about, the time the text is written in, and the time the text is read. And so these are you know the the time the, time the text is read is obviously shifting. So. Uh, so this this is, I think, one of the reasons why 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 books are such a, a magical and almost you know immortal thing because they, because they take on new dime. You know, if you're reading Paradise Lost in 2021, it's a different thing to the Paradise Lost you were reading in you know when I first read it, say in 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 the, in the 1980s. It's a different text to me, but um, but but I think I I, I wasn't. It, you know, it all, it's hard to distinguish what's conscious and, sub, you know, like, for example, I could, you know, when I was writing, when I came to write Tokyo Year Zero, I was writing that in um, 2000, you know, I was researching it and writing it in the immediate aftermath of the invasion of Iraq. And it was, I think that was quite uppermost in my mind about, I was writing about this, this American occupation, about this defeated this defeated country, this this like ruined city, and yeah, you know, and I, so I, so that that I, that I was conscious of. Um, I I don't um, I I can't really, to be honest, to say that I was I I can't say that like that I was like particularly trying to highlight, you know, like I don't the, the novel really was written over such a long period of time and also for example you know it was it was actually you know it, it was published this year but it should have been published last year so i mean it was right i'd, I'd you know i'd really finished time playing it. its and, tricks again yeah so um but i <clears throat> but i'm not i i what i'm saying i, I don't want to I, I don't want to try to like uh admit to some kind of like um great you know great you know but i you know i i it, but think certainly I would be things like that go through you as you write. I mean, as, and I'm sure it's the same for you, but when you're writing, you know, so much of, so much is, is, is beyond you. It's just things that, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard to, I mean, you know, I mean, it, it does sound utterly pretentious, but there is, you know, you, you know, I think you're, you're aware of a tenth of what you're doing probably. Yeah, sure. I, for, for me, it's more um, a kind of a tenth of what's in my head actually ends up on the page if I'm lucky. If I'm yeah, yeah. You know, on a good yeah. day. No, but, um, yeah. so but, that's what. Sorry, that's what, So all, no, no. That's so that's actually that's a yeah. So that's what I. So 
a tenth, a tenth of what's in your head. I, 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 I agree with that exactly. But you know, that, that's why for, for me, my books are always a bitter disappointment because it's just not the book that was in my head, and that's why, that's why, in a way, I keep going because it's not the book that was in my head. Um, but at the same time, what I put down, you know, people will, you know, pe- you know, like so. For example, you know, somebody, you know. Like like you mentioned, Mark, Mark Mark Fisher. I mean, you know, the the, the, the essay he wrote on my, you know, on, on things he's written about red riding and GB eighty four were, you know, he made me see my own work in a very different way. So you know, that's you know, you know uh, uh, because I, you know, and, and it's um, people see things that you don't often see for for various reasons. And is is that a kind of conduit, a two way conduit? You know, does does yeah. that in itself inform the next writing and help you get closer to, to you know, or yeah. is it still does it remain unconscious? No, well, I think that you know, you know, everything you read, every conversation, you know, I mean, I, you know, one of the fantastic things about talking to you now, this, this, I, I mean, I'm sure this conversation will change my writing tomorrow. It's going to make me think differently. And that's a you know and 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 you know the book I'm reading now will make will you know that that that's you know that's the I think we have a bit of a horror of change. I don't know if it's a peculiarly English thing, but we have a bit of a kind of like oh you know I mean it's always said as an insult, isn't it? In England, oh you've changed, you've really changed. But you know it's like <laughs> yeah, but, well, yeah, it certainly is, certainly is not, it certainly is around Jewsbury. You know, but like he's really changed. It's like an insult, but to me it's. You know, it's a you know you should be. You, I mean, I mean, I'm really will be. You know, everything I read and the conversations, I'm looking to be educated and to learn, and and to and to improve. You know, as a you know person writer. You know, what you know, you, you what you want you want to change. Yeah, I I, th- I like the kind of um, the chord of optimism we're striking we're striking there, <laughs> particularly towards the end of our time. Because a question I had for you, um, I didn't want to end on, uh, but. Um, you know, one of, one of, I think one of the most fascinating features of your crime writing is that your detectives and protagonists are kind of futureless in the sense, you know, they're, as we've mentioned, they're kind of people haunted and consumed by living history. They're often chasing its shadow until it smothers them sometimes. And when the book stops, there's often the impression that they stop, um, you know, to go back to Mark's phrase, you know, sorry, the future's cancelled. You know, and this, this future is something we're all increasingly anxious and uncertain about. You know, with the climate and refugee crises, yeah. things that are going on in Afghanistan, and, you know, the synchronicities with that when you started the trilogy in Iraq, you know, military occupations withdrawing, yeah. and of course, the pandemic, growing inequality, the resurgence of the far right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, I suppose my question then is, is this better? Is this a better future possible? You know, or is this fallen world you depict of corruption and complicity devouring everybody, even those politicized to it? But I, I, I mean, I write that world in the hope that the recognition wake, wakes people. I, I mean, the, you, you know, but I think to confront it is the only way that you can, you know, we have to confront the, the, these, these issues. Um, and that's the only way we're ever going to have a conversation about, about, uh, about uh, the conversation or, or take the action, to, to be honest, that, that's going to be needed to, to, to change. So although... You know, I mean, I, 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 I you know, I, I, re- I realize that you know, a, a lot of my, you know, the protagonists in my novel have no future. I mean, literally, often have no future, and that they end up, you know, dead. Not to give away things that happen in the books, but they end up dead. And but actually, I, I, I do myself remain, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm not denying the reality of it as, as you just described it, but, but I, I, I will always, always believe that, that that people have the fundamental capacity to change and make a better world if we acknowledge the situation we're in now. Mm-hmm. So do you see then your crime writing partly in terms of this ongoing political project, almost, you know, the crime novel as a potential agent for progressive change? Yeah, very much. I, I yeah. mean, I, I, you know, I, you know, I take the, you know, I just would take the line because Manchette said it better than you know, the great French crime left wing crime writer, uh, John Patrick Manchette said it better than anyone. You know, the crime writing is the is the great moral literature of our time. You know, it, it's the, you know, it's it has the, you know, the, it, it has the, you know, it really has that capacity, that that potential to to really really highlight the inequalities, the injustices 
that, 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 that infect our society. And until those inequalities and injustices are confronted and changed, then, then things will not improve. But we have to confront them. <laughs> So do you think it's the crime novelist's responsibility then um, to advocate for the betterment of society, for us to confront the injustices and the hypocrisies and the complicity? Um, or are you wary? Or, or do, you know, you know, there are novelists, you know, in and, in and outside the genre who, um, you know, think that's not the novel's responsibility. Um, you know, do, do you have a kind of response to that? Or do you, or do you think the novel can be, it's not necessarily mutually exclusive? I, you know, I, I mean, every, you know, Every book that's written is a political, you know, there is no, you know, everything is political. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you cannot, I mean, people can abdicate that responsibility. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I mean, in, you know, I, I, I'm just advocating that, um, that, that I, I think that, the, that, 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 that potential is there and that, you know, that crime writers, you know, the more crime writers, shall I, I'll put it this way, the more crime writers that, that take, that take that that address that potential, that take on that responsibility. Um, I think that the, the, the better I would have thought. agreed. Agreed. Um, now I have a, a couple of quick questions. I've come from my students. Um, is that okay? Yeah, great. Okay, so one student says, "Quote: I grew up in Wakefield, South Yorkshire, at the same time as you. You be David Peace, and you dis your description of setting and the sense of impending doom is incredibly accurate in the Red Riding Quartet. How and why did you distill your prose and dialogue to such a degree? Was this in response to the subject and setting, or were you inspired by the techniques of other writers you admire?" Um, I. I, I but possibly, but possibly both. I, I um, you know, you know, the, so I, but, you know, when I came to when I arrived in Tokyo in nineteen ninety four and bought, uh, bought, I, I, I began the Red Riding Quartet. I mean, I was, you know, I think that I think for I think really think that the distance from like like the literal distance both like uh being on the other side of the world but also from the time i think that really really helped me you know it's pre the internet um uh it, it really really helped me to you know to try to recapture that 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 time and that place which i i was really just looking for the answers about you know why the crimes of the well Certainly, when I was writing 1977 and 1980, the, 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 what I was trying to find out was what you know why why those crimes, the crimes of the Yorkshire Ripper, took place in that time and place I'd grown up in, and, and I kind of through you know I you know my, my mother would actually go down to like Wakefield Library and photocopy like various bits of the Wakefield Express or the Yorkshire Post and post them over to me, or I mean I could find some kind of like the British newspapers in the in the Tokyo National Library and I was just trying to kind of and then you know trying to recreate that kind of language and that time of place to try to find out what it was that you know what why 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 those crimes happened in that society but I think the initial idea to go back and write because actually like so 1974 was although it was my first published book I think it was the, like, the second or third like novel I'd written it wasn't that you know I'd written I'd written I'd written a huge, huge novel that was like lit, was literally rejected by every publisher in the UK, and that was why I went to Istanbul and then to Tokyo. So, these horror stories are quite comforting to our students, I imagine. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Well, don't give up because I mean, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd um, you know, I, I'd written two novels, two novels. I'd written a, I'd written a play for the uh, for the, uh, the 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 exchange in Manchester, which actually had the, the very worst ever. You know, people wrote back right really violently saying don't ever write a play again as long as Oof. you live and and i had i'd written screenplays I'd, I'd i'd you know by the time i left the uk i'd i you know I'd, i don't know how, i mean how many yeah i must have written you know the, the novel itself was five hundred thousand words there was another novel of about hundred thousand words there was the play there were three screenplays and I, and but, but actually one of the best things that happened to me was when i went to istanbul uh, for about two years, I didn't really. I, I was so upset by all the rejections that I didn't really, I didn't really write anything. And I think then when I came out of that, you know, what what, what I when when I got to Tokyo, um, I decided I wanted to reread the LA Quartet. And when I read, reread Elroy's um, 
LA Quartet. And I think, I'd, 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 and there, you know, it was in those days, there was only a few, there was like one second hand bookshop in Tokyo that sold English, English books. And I think I'd read like some, you know, uh, Andrew Vax and James Lee Burke and um, um, James Crumley and Walter Mosley. And then there was some, I'd, they had even had some Derek Raymond and I'd read on read all this. And then I'd really run out of anything more to read. And I thought, what do I want to read now? And And that, really 1974 was just me writing the book that I wanted to read very much inspired by El so in answer to the student's question it, it very much initially inspired by Elroy writing about the time and he pl place he grew up which was LA in the 40s and 50s so so there was a direct inspiration from a writer but then but it was me but but the, the actual then attempt to kind of capture that was I think was very much, I, I think it, I don't I don't think it's particularly I, th I think I, I you know there's there's, there's a very much a Elroy elements in in the Red Riding books but I think there's other writers there I think Derek Raymond was it was it was a Ted Lewis I think there's a very you know Stan Barstow John Brain um, um, Alan Shilito I mean there are a lot of a lot, so many you know and then you know, ha Hammett and so many different writers kind of you know, Beckett Elliot so so many writers that. It's just all there, really. Mm -hmm. You yeah, kind of the, the, the summation of all those influences and plays yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another question from from a student: How long does it generally take you to write a novel after the extensive research phase? Uh, well, it, well, that, it really, really does depend. I, I would have, you, you know, yeah. You know, the amazing thing to me is that actually, I, I, you know, I wrote the Red Riding Quartet while working full time. Um, you know, in in five years, and it's then I think, and then, and actually, like very, very honestly, I cannot remember writing 1977, which is actually like probably, my, which is actually possibly why it's my favourite book. So I, I mean, literally, it felt to me like I just kind of woke up and there it was. I, I, that was a very kind of trance-like experience. Um, but GB84 took it. Yeah, so GB84 took a year of like very solid research, and then took about a year to write. Um, and that was true for the Damned United, and it was true for Tokyo Year Zero and Occupied City. But the, actually, Red or Dead took a year's research and a year to write. Uh, Patient X, Patient X was, you know, as I said to you earlier, it was it was an ongoing thing, so that's harder. But I mean, but on the other hand, Redux really on and off took the best part of ten years. Mm -hmm. But I, I always hope it's going to take, you know, I, you know, I'm working on a book now about, you know, about Harold Wilson in the 1970s. And I've, the research has gone more than a year. But I'm re, but, I, but I also I started writing. I did I did the usual thing of trying to write prematurely. I wrote 60,000 words and realized they weren't very good. And so I now. So, you know, but so useful scaffolding, think, though. Well, yeah, but I, but yeah, that's kind of you to say. Not, I'm not having read it. <laughs> so, but uh, but um, I, I one thing I would say to uh, to any student or anybody interested in writing is the old Orwell thing of don't write. You know, don't write too soon. You know, like really, really, it's it's to you know see to see the scenes, to hear the characters, the world in your mind. Because I, I, I think sometimes the impatience gets the better of me, and I start to write, and and, and then actually, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it, you, it's not the right moment. Okay, it's really really useful advice. Um, uh, yeah, one last question. So our students um, read some contemporary Japanese crime fiction on our course at UEA, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier. Um, yeah. Often female writers like uh, Kane Minato, who wrote Confessions, and yeah. Yatsuo Kirino, who um, yeah. her big book in the West was out. Um, yeah. She also wrote Grotesque and, and, and a few others. Um, and one student asked, do these crime writers and their critiques have an effect on society and perceptions within Japan? Um, well, I would say, yeah. I, you know, I... I um, I mean, one of the one of the things about writers. I mean, writers in Japan have a. Um, um, there's, there's still a huge um, emphasis placed on the short story here. So um, there are lots of magazines with short stories, and the newspapers, you know, the daily newspapers run short stories, um, and so 
the, um, often novels are serialized still in newspapers or, or online be, before publication and then amended, like like in the old kind of we, mm-hmm. we, something we're more familiar with from like Dickens, for example. But that's still, sure. that's still ongoing. And actually, I think the, the advantage of that is that whether it's crime or other kind of writing, I think it gives the writers a, a kind of a kind of a, a kind of they they, they 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 seem more integrated into the daily lives of. It's hard for me to judge not being in the UK, but I, but I but I always think the writers here seem a little bit more integrate, you know, integrated into in many ways. But but something like, for example, I mean, somebody like for example, somebody I really admire, for example, such as Kirino. Uh, I mean, I think she she really she you know it, it, I mean out really shone a you know the the book that that's been the most famous book, but her books really shine a light on social issues. And actually, she's she's actually the, the interesting thing is because again she does straddle that kind of the social crime, but also there's, there's, there is quite a gothic element to a lot of her writing. Yeah, as almost well. like Grand Guignol element to some of yeah. the some yeah. of the violence and yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's very shocking. So, I, I, yeah, I wonder if I think one of her books was even censored in its English translation in the West, wasn't it? Some of the scenes of violence were taken out. I think for yeah. for, for, yeah. for yeah. North American publication. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I might be wrong on that, but I think I think yeah. I think I am yeah. right. Yeah, and a book, for example, a book, um, gro- the book she wrote, grotesque, was was actually based on a real life was on the on the on the on the real life murder of a woman in in Tokyo. Um, so I mean, she does she 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 she's a she's a very interesting you know, the way that she, the way that she does take real crimes and social issues. I mean, she fictionalizes them. It's not it's not quite as close to the record as the work I do, but she's um, yeah, she's a great yeah great, and and she's quite a Perhaps less so these days, but but she was, you know, she would be invited on to, you know, chat shows and stuff to speak about family and social issues and things. Yeah, she's a kind so of public a, intellectual as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, I think we're we're coming to towards the end of our time, um, um, but I think we'd like to um, end on a reading, if that's okay. Would you like yep. to read from I'll, from the new I'll, book, I'll, Tokyo I'll, Redux? From the new book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Great. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Darkness covered Tokyo, covered Tokyo again, an old and hidden darkness that had never gone away, that had stayed silent round corners, waiting in rooms, under floors and under stairs, silent and waiting behind screens, behind doors in the wood of a shrine, the pockets of a uniform on the other side of sunshine, in the damp of a handshake, the space between words, the blank and empty spaces of promises and toasts, behind the smile, behind the teeth, in the hollows of laughter, the cold black pupil of an eye, but in the blink of an eye was back again, all black again, that darkness back again, rolling over Tokyo, pouring over Tokyo in clouds and in waves so thick and so tall, with the clap of its thunder, the whistle of its train, which shook the night, which pierced the night, waking it is said, MacArthur in his bed in fright, in the night, pale and deathly white, he screamed, old soldiers, never die, never die, Blacky and Yuki, Brownie and Coco, howling with their master's voice, the terror in his voice, the emperor too, his other dog the living dead is said is said that night it said he rose in dread in robes of red to light the lanterns for the dead the old bond lanterns for the spirits of the dead the restless spirits of the dead in whispered chants by lantern light the dead they said in shades we fade we fade away but never never go away silent and waiting we come again we come again so thick and tall in cloud and waves rolling over tokyo pouring over tokyo torrents of darkness Torrents of rain over the tracks and over the cops, the darkness and the rain so ferocious and strong, it knocked the policemen from their feet, picking up the parts of his body from the tracks, the pieces of his flesh from the rails, they slipped and they fell in the dirt, in the mud, dropped the parts of his body, the pieces of his flesh, tumbling down the embankment, splattered here and there, the cops and the corpse, akimbo, akimbo, the cops and the corpse, dancing akimbo, divided and splayed, the cops and the corpse, forever akimbo. Kimbo in that Ankoku dance, dancing in the dark, the darkness over Tokyo, over Tokyo again, over Tokyo and me again, 
yes, me again, for there was I, yes, there was I, in the torrents of darkness, the torrents of rain, at the scene of a crime, the author of a crime, drenched and soaked with his blood on my hands, dark to the bone, cowering in the shadows, weeping in the weeds, in blood drops and tear drops, cried I, said I, would I could raise the dead, resurrect the man from these tracks, the parts of his body, the pieces of his flesh, steal his body from this scene, save his flesh from this crime, yes, then and there, it was then and there, in the torrents of darkness, in the torrents of rain, yes, then and there, it was then and there, in the shadows and the weeds, vowed I, said I, I will make the parts of his body, the pieces of his flesh, I will put them together again, stitch them back together again, word by word, sentence by sentence, put him together again, make this man whole again, line by line, and page by page, I will raise the dead, resurrect the man, chapter by chapter, chapter and verse, I will write this crime, I will write this wrong. Well, thank you for that reading and thank you again, David Peace, for your time and for all your thank thoughtful you. responses um, and cheers so much just for writing no, this thanks, book. Tom. No, thanks, Tom. Thank you very much.